I have to walk. If you didn't figure that out yesterday, I can't stand still, so that's not going to happen. Um, I'm Katie Johnson. This is UX in the Age of AI. And just by way of introduction, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I have found myself at the intersection of emergent tech and deep human needs for my entire career. I actually started my career in the flight deck. Mac and I were just talking about this. Uh, studying with neural networks how to describe how pilots behave in the cockpit, depending on what automation we put in there. From there, I went to study VR and AR in the oil field um, in like the 2014, 2016 timeframe. I did a brief two year stint in blockchain from 2018 to 2020 before it was cool. Um, and then most recently have spent the last year and a half um, since the beginning of 2022 studying generative AI um, at Google and now at Johanna Panasonic Well. Um, I was the lead UX researcher for BARD from December to May when I left. We can talk about that not in this big forum, but if you have questions, we can talk about that. Um, but I, I start with this image because this is actually an image from Mid Journey that I wrote on the Mid Journey Discord um, a year ago about Katie, Katie Mogul will recognize this. An AI chatbot evolved to recommend music and be my friend. This is something that we've been thinking about for a long time, and this is what Mid Journey came back with a year ago. What I want to relate to you after 18 months in the field is that while there is a lot of this, you know, Liz talked about this, there's a lot of this that's similar to other new tech trends. You can take it from someone who literally had to work on a project that was blockchain, but in space. Um, in 2018, which we can also talk about, uh, there's things that are different this time. Studying these, these technologies now with people, it became distinctly clear to me that we are actually seeing a new layer of UI emerge right now. It's happening now. Um, it's already happening. Just like we saw with VUI, Voice UI, emerging a couple years ago, we are going to see the emergence of what I'm currently calling relationship UI. Um, and if we don't design that, we're going to really, really regret it. What does it look like if we don't design this relationship? Liz talked about this being like a, let's just do it. Let's just go forward and learn, ship some stuff, see what happens. There's a lot of that going around, right? Um, I talk about it like it's Chevy Chase plugging the two plugs together in Christmas vacation and just hoping to God the lights turn on, right? Like that, that produces bad stuff that causes things like people that are smart, accomplished engineers working on these products, wondering if they're sentient. Like, right, that, like, like that causes people being in sexual relationships with Replica that when Replica turns off sexy time, they've lost their primary sexual partner. That looks like a New York Times reporter who, by the way, wrote another article on AI, I think this morning or last night, um, which you should check out, Kevin. Uh, Roos, I think is his last name. Some of you know him, I think, personally. Um, that looks like him being in a conversation with the dark side of Bing's chatbot, Sydney, talking about how he's in a loveless marriage, right? Um, we are responsible for this. We know how this story ends if we don't design this new RUI. We know. Social media has taught us what happens if we just find out. And I, for one, do not want to be sitting in a documentary 20 years from now being like, we just had no idea, guys. Like, we were just trying things out. We didn't know. Like, we know. We know. Liz knows. You know. We know. And it is on us to not do that because we know that what happens if we don't is abuse, dark patterns, systemic racism, all these other things, like bad, the bad, worst, most terrible parts of us that kind of show up again. And it's really easy, this last one here on the bottom, I know these are really grayed out purposefully, I don't want you reading all these articles. Uh, the, la the last one here on the bottom is Taybot. Um, I hope everyone in this room knows about Taybot. If you don't, take five minutes and learn about Taybot. It's really easy to say, just don't be Taybot. In fact, when I first started working on LLMs at Google, that was what we said. Don't be Taybot. Taybot was shut down in 24 hours in 2016 because it became a racist Nazi after it joined the world on Twitter um, 24 hours later, and it had to be taken down. Literally, Microsoft went home for the night, came back, and they had a racist bot that was just running amok on the internet, right? Like, it's really easy to say, don't be Taybot. It's much, much harder to say, let's do this right. Let's do it 
together collaboratively. And now that you know, you've heard me talk about all the doom and gloom, and Liz talked a little bit about this, I want to reiterate that I actually share Liz's hope. I'm an incredibly optimistic person. Um, I'm married to a man who's working on generative AI. You who heard from him earlier today. And I think there's actually incredible potential here uh, because if we do this right, if we allow AI to come into our lives and we collaboratively design this new RUI and we make it adaptive, and we'll talk more about that momentarily, and we study it and make it with people, not for people or at people, um, we can unlock massive potential. We can give people things like a second brain, which we know they desperately need, right? We can let people do the things that they love, the things they're good at, and fill in the gaps adaptively moment to moment, help them accomplish more than they could ever have accomplished before without taking on things that, that you know, we, they shouldn't or don't want us to take on. Now, I assume many of you were alive and practicing in the field when Minority Report was the UI that everybody was like, oh my God, just make it like Minority Report. Just make my, my app like Minority Report. And I wanna call attention to the fact that like, if we do this right, Minority Report is going to look antiquated by comparison because you still have Tom Cruise learning incredibly complicated gestural mechanics and interacting with data by himself. Imagine a world where he and the computer or any of you in the computer are conducting information like a symphony together, moving and adapting and, and changing the world together instead of you know having one person, just like Photoshop used to be, have to learn 300,000 keyboard shortcuts to be effective, right? And relationships are gonna change. This RUI needs to be adaptive all the time. It can be obvious, Michael talked about this earlier, to have a different uh, relationship with a sous chef application, which was literally the word I was gonna say, and then you did it first, which is awesome. Um, than you would have with someone who you're co-composing music with, right? But I also believe as we get more familiar, more contextually aware, these things are going to change in each user, each use case, and maybe even each session. So we need to be ready for that. Okay, so why should we care? Liz already talked a little bit about this. Um, I'm here to tell you, friends, that since the tech is evolving so fast, the mental model is evolving so fast, we too must evolve. We must evolve our practices, we must evolve the way we ask questions, the way we inspect and study this phenomenon um, so that we can catch it and tune it and work with it to build something new. And so just to like put this into kind of very concrete examples, I'm going to share with you, you know, relationships change over time. How many of you in this room have accidentally or purposefully used a pronoun or a pleasantry to interact with Siri or Alexa? Yes? Me? I do it. Did you have you ever cursed at them? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you know why you started doing that, or or even when, or how you started giving Siri a pronoun, or saying thanks? I don't. Right. That's just the beginning. Like the things that come after that are humor, inside jokes, slang, shared colloquialisms, history. Right. And sooner or later, something that we're calling bot self-disclosure where you inadvertently, perhaps, ask the bot something about itself. This can happen after the bot says, you should read The Great Gatsby, Nikki. And you say, okay, why? And it says, oh, like, because I think it's an incredible, you know, piece on the ephemeral nature of the American dream and youth. And then you start reading this book and you start to think to yourself, damn, that bot was right. And now you're in relationship with the bot, right? Like, it happens very, very subtly. And yet, over time, that starts to add up. And so when we start to talk about like what we could do, we're talking about longitudinal studies where we're observing and looking for these harbingers of emotional connection over time. We're also adding on, so that can happen in, a, in like a D-Scout diary study, but now also adding on interviews, also adding on check-ins with the human and maybe even the bot to ask how they're perceiving each other. How do they think about each other? How do they feel about each other? How is that changing over time? Okay, and the reason that we're doing this, and, and Liz alluded to this in her talk as well, is that, okay, who cares what the next word in the sentence is, right, Kevin? Like, the next word in the sentence isn't that big of a deal, but you know what is a big deal? The power dynamic, right? The power dynamic really, really effing matters, and it, it is going to change 
over time. It is always going to start, at least I think for now, where human is in control and machine is receiving and responding to human commands. But as it gets more familiar, as it learns more about you, as it becomes your second brain that you can't live without, that power dynamic can shift, sometimes drastically. And when we see like this replica having to turn sexy time back on thing happen, that's because the power dynamic shifted. And we didn't even know it happened. And we have to fix it, right? So we know power dynamics are dangerous. <laughs> we know they exist. We know that if bots go out onto the internet, they're going to learn about them and they're going to learn from the worst of us. And we need to think as a, as a practice whether or not it ever makes sense for the bot and the human to have equal power, whether it ever makes sense for the bot to have more. So let, let me just again bring this home. This can be subtle. Like, who cares that the bot likes Taylor Swift if I like Metallica, right? Like, whatever, it's cool, we're just friends. But then all of a sudden the bot's like, Katie, you should really give Taylor Swift another chance. Okay, that's maybe fine too. If that bot is Spotify's AI robot and I've asked it to play Metallica and that bot tells me it's just gonna play Taylor Swift until I say I like her, now we have a problem, right? Like, and that's a subtle version, but that's how it starts. Okay, so that was a lot to throw at you in 10 minutes and where do we go from here? I want to leave you with an enduring sense of hope and obligation, not to put too much pressure on you, but there's a lot of pressure on us. Um, it is our job. It is our job to go out and define this new RUI with our users, with our stakeholders, not to be naysayers, not to you know, shirk the responsibility that lies in front of us. Liz invited you to get educated, please do that, because it's our job to advocate for our users from the dangers we already know about and the dangers we don't. Because the worst thing that could happen is we're gonna fail them in ways we don't even know yet. And that is not an acceptable op outcome as far as I'm concerned. So I invite you to get educated, invent with me and with us new ways to study and detect these emergent relationships and work with our stakeholders to define better, more supportive relationships so that we can truly unlock potential and sidestep some of these very, very dangerous outcomes that we do not want for ourselves, our children, our users, our friends. Um, thank you.